So we'll start with uh, lecture 12, uh, which is the second part of uh, SAM instrumentation. Here we're going to talk about uh, more about the different parts of a uh, SAM device. So in last class, uh, we actually were about to start with uh, the vacuum requirements. Uh, we already have talked about uh, the basic principle of SAM operation and we know that uh, the column needs to be kept inside vacuum. Now we need to understand what is the main reason why we actually need the vacuum and so on. So, so in very simple words, uh, it means that uh, we actually are going to get uh, an output result and uh, we do not want uh, the electrons which are actually the uh, source uh, to uh, get deflected or cause any kind of secondary reaction which we do not want. Okay? So, basically we have uh, learnt about vacuum in our earlier classes okay, in one of the units. So, in the vacuum type, uh, we have learned there are different types of vacuum pump. In SAM, we basically employ two types of vacuum pump. One is a rotary pump and another is a diffusion pump. If you remember, a rotary pump is one of the initial pumps which is used and it is basically used for roughing. So, that means a rough vacuum is created using uh, the rotary pump. On the other hand, if we want to vacuum it further, we want to have a higher level of vacuum. We basically use a diffusion pump in association with a rotary pump. We need to recall this fact that diffusion pump cannot be used on a, a solo level. We need to combine it with rotary pump and use it. So, this is very important for producing a consistent electron beam. So, the pump uh, that uh, uh, is done is actually uh, very important because in case uh, the sample is moist, uh, uh, then the pump time uh, can be longer. So, that means it will take longer time to actually pump out uh, all the air in from the system. So, we need to have a sample which is uh, completely dry. Okay, But in case you are studying some uh, wet samples, uh, might be a biological sample, then the microscope design itself is uh, different. So, that means if we use something like an environmental scanning electron microscope, those kind of SAM can actually read the um, wet samples or biological samples. But here we are concentrating only on the type of uh, samples uh, which should be dry to be used in the SAM. So, uh, the simple procedure is uh, this that if we have the vacuum system, uh, most of the time it is under vacuum, but uh, in order to, uh, to get the specimen into the uh, microscope, we vent the chamber. That means, we let the air inside the chamber. After that, we can definitely open the chamber we will put the sample onto the stage as we have seen before in the image and then we will evacuate the chamber again and then we basically start our experiment. So, this is the basic procedure which which we are doing it. Okay. So, the question is why we need to vacuum. So, vacuum uh, if it is on a very higher level it usually minimizes the scattering of the electron beam before it reaches the specimen. So, before the electron reaches the specimen we want that the electron should be more or less focused and it should not be scared, so scattered. So, then the vacuum system is used. So, scattering or attenuation, by attenuation we mean the loss of signal of the electron beam which is generated and getting incident on the sample will increase the probe size and reduce resolution. Okay. So, we want, uh, do not want that. Okay. So, we do not want the electron good scattered or attenuate, else the probe size get reduced. We need a very focused beam and we need the high resolution. Now, the high vacuum condition also optimizes uh, collection efficiency, especially of the secondary electron. So, we have a number of electrons which are basically incident. Uh, we need to uh, optimize the system okay, to gather maximum signal and for that we need vacuum. So, SAMS may be also operated in low vacuum mode, but only under certain specific condition for certain specific samples. Okay. It depends on surface charging. So, backscattered electron and the characteristic X-ray are generally of higher energy than secondary electron. Okay. So, they have a higher energy um, and their detection is not critically dependent on the high vacuum being maintained in the specimen chamber. So, if you consider something like a secondary electron for to detect uh, to understand the sample, we need high vacuum because they are affected by uh, other uh, um, uh, let us say air present within the system. But if we consider something having a very high energy, for example, the backscattered electron or the characteristic X-ray all have got very high energy. So, even if the vacuum is low, still we are getting enough signal to be reaching the detector. 
So what happens is in this mode, when we actually use a low vacuum mode, a small amount of air is leaked into the chamber, chamber where it ionizes and reduces the surface charging of insulating samples. Okay. So what happens is it will ionize and it will reduce the surface charging of the insulating sample. So there is a problem of surface charging which happens. Basically, we also coat the samples, okay? But we will learn about that more in our TAM example, okay? But let's just remember this right now. The next part of the instrument is called the water chilling system. And as the name suggests, it basically keeps the system cool. Now, if you are using a lot of magnetic uh, lenses, uh, then there is a chance that it will actually heat up, okay? We are using a power source, okay? We are uh, using some electromagnetic field. So it heats up. But it is very important that the temperature of the system should be constant and should be maintained at around 20 degrees centigrade. That's even lower than the room temperature in general in India, right? So what happens is uh, whenever, uh, whichever room you're keeping your same instrument, there is always an AC fitted to it to additionally keep the system cool. What happens is if the system is made in such a way that in case the chiller fails and the temperature goes up, okay, the magnetic lens usually heats up the sample or the system, the same will actually automatically shut down. So that system is already done. Now there are a number of lenses we have studied, the condenser lens, the objective lens and so on. Okay, So let's just study a bit about these lenses. So these lenses are electromagnetic in nature, so we can actually apply electric field and uh, obviously there is a magnetic field which is also there okay so we do have a series of electromagnetic lenses depending on what kind of system or what which company is selling you the product uh, all designs might be slightly different okay so whatever we have seen in the schematic is a very basic picture so we do have a series of electromagnetic lenses and the apertures are used to reduce the diameter of the electron source so our aim is to reduce the diameter of the electron sieves and not to allow it to spread okay so we basically what we do we place a small focused beam of electron onto the specimen so if we basically have the specimen here and we have some it here we want a very small focused beam should reach here okay and not a very broad um, beam so for this focusing in general when we use an optical microscope we basically use a lens okay let's say a concave lens so basically a ray might come from parallelly from some distance and basically it will start converging. So the same thing is done by an electromagnetic lens also. So this lens system, electromagnetic lens, every lens is basically having this provision of providing an electric and magnetic field. But this lens system is divided uh, into two, uh, three parts, okay. Once one we have got as the condenser lens, then we have got the objective lens and then we have got the scanning coil. So we are going to look into it one by one. So this lens does the same thing as it's done by a glass or a plastic lens in case of a light microscope but definitely we cannot use the glass or the transparent plastic because they bend light and they are used in optical lenses but when it comes to something like uh, electron it cannot actually pass through these lenses okay so it cannot pass then definitely it cannot reach the sample so we don't use that so we use electromagnetic lenses so this is a schematic of an electromagnetic lens okay and if you are applying an electric and magnetic field and if you remember all your electromagnetism in general we know that the electron will basically follow a spiral path. So the electrons are charged, so the path can be bent by a magnetic field. So electrons are charged particles, negatively charged particles. And then the lenses for electrons are constructed with uh, ferromagnetic material and wound copper web. So these lenses where you actually apply a magnetic field, you can actually apply some current and then the magnetic field may be there and then you can stop the magnetic field, that is also a possibility. But the material which is basically used is ferromagnetic because ferromagnetic material we can easily magnetize them okay and then the copper wear is owned what is the reason for wearing the uh, wearing it with copper wear because we also want to pass the current through it okay uh, so that the focal length uh, can be changed now if you remember if you have a point here if you use your magnifying glasses to burn some papers in your childhood even now you might do it so you basically have a lens here okay this is basically a convex lens and then rays of light are coming from a far distance and then you focus it okay but in general if you change the position of this uh, lens what happens is it might be here the focus might be here but your paper might be here or on the other hand if it is a bit far the focus might be here okay but your paper might still be here okay so that is a possibility so that means which is the ideal condition that we need so that means focusing is very very important 
and that is why we are using the copper wire where you can actually apply some current so that the focusing can be done for the uh, beam of electrons. So under the influence of the magnetic field electrons assume a helical path as I said and it will spiral down the column. So it will basically follow a spiral path and go down. So there are two lens uh, sets okay, in general. Uh, so these are the condenser lens and the objective lens. Both have got uh, some specific purpose. So what happens is the electron beam will travel through the condenser lens first. That is the first that happens. Okay. So as we know by condenser we mean that it is basically going to make the beam more and more condensed or more the dense in general dense. Okay. So this condenser lens will converge the cone of the electron beam to a spot below it. So it will basically converge the beam spot below it. I have an image in the next slide. I will show it to you. And uh, what is objective? What happens is before the cone flares out. So we have the uh, electron beam coming out of the condenser and then it actually again can flare out. Okay, It can again diverge and then it is again converged by using this objective lens down onto the sample. Okay, So this is exactly what is done in case of this. So what happens is this, the main role of the objective lens is to focus the beam onto the sample. So as I told you in the previous slide that focusing is very important. So this is what the objective lens does. But then if we want to know the, adjust the diameter of the spot size on the electron beam of the spot size of the electron beam on the specimen surface that is also achieved by using these lenses objective lens as well. Okay, So objective lens and condenser lens works in tandem to get a focused uh, spot size and the diameter of the spot size can also be controlled by using these lenses. Now in case the condenser lens is not very much aligned then what happens the objective lens also cannot uh, give you the best result. So that means the focus will be disturbed the spot size will be changed and so on. So we cannot control it properly. So the alignment is also very important. So a focused beam produces a smaller spot on the surface that is under or over focused beam. So if you consider an under focused or an over focused beam that is not is not something that we want. We actually need a beam which produces a smaller spot. So that means if the spot is smaller and focused we are basically going to get a resolution which will be much higher. So if you look into this image uh, and we have the sample here and uh, we want to focus it this is basically nothing but a perfect focus. But on the other hand if we just uh, consider something as under focus this will be the condition where the focus will be before the uh, uh, beam has reached uh, the sample. On the other hand if it is over focused the beam spot will be much higher we cannot control the beam size and the uh, focus will be below the sample. So this is not something which you want. This is the right position. So this is not it should not be there. This should not be there. Hence we use the combination of electric and magnetic field to achieve the same. The third uh, kind of uh, lens we can say is nothing but basically called the scanning coil or the scan coils. Uh, so if we actually have a sample if you remember in our last lecture we have seen some scanning images of SEM. So if we have this much space of the specimen we scan it okay, and we scan it line by line. So what happens is. Uh, the scanning coils will allow the electron beam to deflect and allow to fall it on this line let's say and then it goes back and falls on this line and then it goes and falls on this line and this way it keeps on scanning the entire sample. So the formation of an image uh, which we get the entire image of the sample requires a scanning system to construct the image point by point and line by line. So we need each and every points data to be collected by the detector. And when the electron falls on that particular point that is the only image that we are going to get. But that is not our aim. We want to get the image of the entire sample or the entire surface. So what we do is at one point it is done for some time and then it goes to the next point and next point and so on and it keeps on scanning the entire sample. So what does the scanning system do? A scanning system uses two pairs of electromagnetic deflection coils which are basically called scan coils and they scan the beam along the line. And then displace the line position to the next scan okay, so that a rectangular raster is generated both on the specimen or on the viewing screen. I think this is a very much self explanatory you don't need to uh, think much about these lines. okay. So it will go from point to point and it will actually scan in a rectangular pattern so that the, until and unless the entire sample is on the screen or the entire sample is getting scanned. okay. So this uh, scanning is basically is called what we call as rastering. Okay. So that is the technical term. So in SEM what is rest running 2 marks okay. 
So the scanning coils deflect the electron beam horizontally and vertically over the specimen surface. This is called rest turning. So if you can control the electric and the magnetic field, we can actually also control the rest turning factor. So then uh, we need to know what are the different kinds of detectors. So I had the electron beam, I have used the condenser and the objective lens to focus the beam on the sample and then I have got the scan camps, uh, scan coils which has actually uh, done the process of rest turning and it has scanned the entire sample and now the electrons or the signal is getting deflected from the sample and that needs to be detected. So that is done by the detector. Now as I have said in one of the previous classes that when electron is incident on a sample of this is your sample and electron is incident, there are a number of process that happens. You might get secondary electrons, you might get backscattered electron, you will get x-rays, you will get photons, you will also get uh, ogre electrons and so on. Okay? So this is what happens here. So for each of them we need a separate kind of detector because their intensity and variation will be more or less different. So different kinds of signal has to be detected after the electron interacts with the sample. So most commonly used signals are, so what are some of the common used signals in SEM? We are just talking about SEM right now. Okay. So we use a secondary electron, one might be secondary electron, then we might have a backscattered electron, then we have got some x-rays which comes out of the system and then we might have some auger electron coming out of the system and then some photons coming out of the system. So in order to detect each of these signals, we use different kinds of detectors. But since I am talking about this, I am not going into the details right now on how the electron interact and what are the signals that we are getting. But we are mainly going to focus on secondary electron and backscattered electron. Now secondary electron are basically uh, secondary in nature, okay, obviously, because what happens is when the incident radiation is falling on it, in this case the electron beam, it will knock out some electrons from the sample. And that gives rise to something which we call as the secondary electron. So this is basically a result of ionization production. Because what happens is if an electron is knocked out of the system, the atoms get ionized and we get secondary electrons. And they are called secondary because they are generated by other radiation. On the other hand, if we consider backscattered electron, the intensity is usually higher for this. The energy is more as we have seen in the previous slide. Uh, we have the beam electrons uh, which are reflected from the sample by elastic scattering. Okay. So kinetic energy, momentum, everything is conserved and we have got the same uh, beam which is incident on the sample being getting scattered okay. and that is called the backscattered electron. But, but this gives a better information because they emerge from deeper locations. Okay. This is a different kind of information that we are extracting from the sample. They emerge from deeper locations within the specimen and consequently we see that the resolution of the backscattered images is less than secondary electron. So obviously the energy might be more but the resolution is less because it is getting extracted from the deeper part of the sample. So let us look a uh, basic understanding or uh, look into the basic understanding of a secondary electron detector. So a secondary electron imaging is ideal for recording the topographical information. So if you want to just get an information of the topography of the morphology of the surface, we basically use a secondary electron imaging. Most of the SAM instrument does have this detector. Now these secondary electrons have energy in the range of 20 to 50 electron volt, uh, which is usually considered to be low and they are ejected from the surface of the sample. Now if the energy is low, I need to... Uh, uh, energy is low and at the same time I need to collect it in the detector. So this is the detector that we are talking about. So these are electrons, these are secondary electrons, these are charged particles. So, so that they can be actually attracted towards the detector. The detector is actually uh, equipped uh, so that it can be uh, given some kind of positive voltage so that the negative electrons can get attracted and we can actually collect the signal. So to collect or attract these low energy electrons, a small bias around 200 to 300 volt is applied at the front end of the detector because it needs to enter from the front end of the detector and it will allow the negative electrons to flow towards the detector. Okay? And then uh, this is more technical in nature but we are not going to go into the detail. Uh, one, a specific name for the type of secondary detector that is used in general in a secondary electron microscope is named as Everhart Thornley detector. Okay? So just remember the name, I think that is enough for now. And then uh, look into the backscattered electron detector. Now backscattered electron detector, the positioning is a bit different. Uh, these detectors are mounted below the objective lens pole piece and centered around the optic axis. 
so i i hope you know this if you remember your uh, lower classes you basically have this and then this is these are the two lenses let's say and if you draw a straight line this is basically considered as the optic axis so it is just uh, below the objective lens pole piece so it is just above the sample you can say and then uh, these are generated as a specimen surface is scanned by the incident electron beam so when the surface is scanned by the electron beam these are again generated also generated along with secondary electrons so the yield here is controlled by topography physical and chemical characteristic of the sample so that means how much backscattered electron is getting generated that is called yield is depending on the topography of the sample the physical and the chemical characteristics of the sample so in other words it means that the backscattered electron can also give me information about the topography it can also talk about the physical and the chemical properties of the sample so that is possible now backscattered electron have higher energy okay than secondary electron of course the resolution is low so that means it can give information to us below the surface of the sample so the same the backscattered electron comes from deep within the sample and we can get a better information about the inside of the sample and then we have got something which is called the x-ray detectors so the x-ray detectors as we know i think we have learnt a lot about x-ray because we have studied xrd uh, when the high energy is incident on and the sample we are getting x-rays we know the k alpha the k beta and so on okay and these x-rays can also be used to uh, study about the sample so the energy of these x-rays is dependent on the elements present in the sample so that means if you are having a combination of sample and you are studying the x-ray that is coming out from the sample and the sample actually is a combination of a number of elements let's say we can actually get the information about all these elements that are present in the sample so that is what is eds is all about we also discussed it uh, roughly in our previous classes so the most common system for detecting the x-ray emitted from the sample is the energy dispersive x-ray spectroscopy so this energy dispersive x-ray spectroscopy is an additional detector which is equipped with a sam or a tab instrument to give information about the samples uh, composition in general so the eds detector is based on a semiconductor crystal basically has a semiconductor crystal and the two most common type of uh, semiconductor crystal are used are lithium drifted silicon which is called sili and the silicon drift detector which is basically called sst okay so these are the types of detectors that we have studied so now we will uh, stop here and continue in the next class thank you